A number of our friends were very kind in their remarks about the series of class talks we gave on self-unfoldment based upon our book. So we decided to try another book and chose one which was written quite a number of years ago, which is itself rather dangerous in the field of science. But since the book was written, I've been watching moderately uh, the opinion rising and developing in the field which the book covers. And um, while it does not seem as though a revision is indicated, perhaps there are some additions we can make. And in a case of this kind, I prefer to work with additions or new material as far as possible, assuming that those who are seriously interested in the basic text have either read somewhat on the subject or in a position to do so. It seems, therefore, that in this first evening, we want to strike at a problem which has not essentially bettered in the last 25 years. More work has been done. Probably much more would have been accomplished if the field had not been restricted by its own basic concepts. Uh, today, the trend is to substantiate as far as possible or to support the broad and prevailing attitude in the world of science. And to the degree that the scientist is orthodox, to that degree he must plod along very slowly, achieving little in his effort to offend none. This uh, process is, um, in a sense, rather tiring. On the other hand, we know the danger that arises from simply plunging into an area unequipped or inadequately disciplined for the particular work to be accomplished. This, in turn, may lead to a series of wild guesses which have very little foundation in secure fact. Of course, our interest in the whole field is essentially philosophical. Therefore, we do not impinge too closely upon the sacred ground of the exact sciences, but we annoy them somewhat at times, and uh, the tendency toward this kind of annoyance is increasing every day. So we want to develop certain themes and problems Perhaps we can define one of our themes uh, from the text itself, which carries um, a series of rather thought-inspiring references to the field under consideration. On page 126, I quote from a textbook of general embryology by Dr. William E. Callicott. And he gives us a few rather priceless gems, um, quote, The province of embryology is not merely thus to describe the upbuilding and unfolding of the structure and form of the new organism. It is further to describe the more fundamental processes involved in this development, and still further, to summarize these descriptions of both kinds in the formation of a simple general statements or laws. This sounds very encouraging. Up to the moment he has said almost nothing, but he has said it very, very well. He goes on and gets himself into trouble. This physiological aspect of embryology is concerned more with how development occurs. How, and through the operation of what factors or mechanisms, one condition leads to another. 
little break while I added a few personal remarks, and then we quoted the doctor again. In a way, this is also the why of development. Not why in the philosophical sense, of course, but the sense of how does it happen that these things occur in development. So he now explains to us that he is working on the premise of a uh, how that literally includes the concept of why, but that the why, of course, is now to be understood in the terms of how. <laughs> uh, this gives you, perhaps, a little idea as to why great bodies move slowly. <laughs> Uh, the situation, however, which we would like to discuss this evening centers directly in this how-why situation, because I think it reaches more deeply into the problem, a problem rather close to many of us in our thinking, than we have done in the book itself, perhaps due to the fact that in the years uh, that, had fo that have followed the publication, much new general information bearing upon the why of things has sort of come along and been stored away for such an occasion as this evening. First of all, most persons today have a fair knowledge of the actual phenomenon of the construction of bodies through a process called mitosis or the multiplication of cells. We also know broadly that this continuing multiplication achieves the gradual building up of the various structures and parts of our corporeal constitution. We have a point on that, which perhaps might be worth mentioning, uh, quoted from Pearsall's Normal Histology. Quotation, according to Donaldson, there are 12,000 million cells in the cortex of the cerebral hemispheres of the human brain. These are all formed by the process of mitosis, which is a broad term covering the various phases of the multiplication of cells. They are all formed by the process of mitosis and all before birth, so that nearly 12,000 million mitoses have occurred in the prenatal period in forming the cells of this region alone. That's a rather large piece of work. Now, science knows these things. Science appreciates the actual phenomenal process. But it has been able to regard this process for a long time without becoming, we might say, reverently aware of the tremendous mystery of universal law and procedure that underlies so complex a procedure continually going on and continually necessary in the development of all structures which we behold in nature. All structures certainly that claim any biological background. This brings us then to a problem of very great importance, and that is the pattern behind this entire procedure, which is now covered by the broad field of the concept of embryology and its related matters. 
the ontogenist is not too well equipped for this type of thinking, but it is inconceivable that he can completely ignore it. So let us see if we can some of the philosophical points that make this field tremendously interesting and spiritually a revelation. In the first place, all of these procedures in nature proceed according to a very simple and direct methodology. All of these processes are suspended from certain principles, and these principles in themselves are not especially numerous, nor are they as principles especially complex or difficult to conceive. Yet these processes in themselves, by their orderly emergence, by their continuance, by the inevitable fact that they set in when the situations and conditions are proper to the processes involved. This in itself and its related thoughts means a great deal when we try to understand life as a living thing rather than merely as an organism. How are we going to trace the principle involved in the perpetuation of organisms? How are we going to understand this process which causes a continual fertility in nature so that all creatures reproduce according to their kind and will continue to do so unless some circumstance or condition brings them to a sudden or gradual termination. Forms of life can perish, but usually the perishing of a form of life is due to circumstances disturbing the conditions which are necessary for the progressive continuity of that form of life. What do we actually have then? We cannot assume that this process is unique or special or peculiar to any body or to any particular form of life. We are forced to the recognition that generation as we understand it is a universal phenomenon that in one way or another it is present everywhere, continually moving life itself, and that the presence of generation or fertility is not primarily due to the fertility of individuals, but due to a principle of fertility which passes from generation to generation does not originate with any generation and usually does not terminate with a particular generation. This unfoldment or continuity of life, however, has a certain fragileness about it. It can end. It can terminate a species or a type of life. It can terminate in sterility by means of which the continuity of one of the fine threads of this fertility can be destroyed. What do we actually have then? We do not have fertile persons. We have fertility moving through persons. We do not have the right to assume that any individual generates his kind merely from himself. He generates primarily because of a power that is not his own, but in which he participates. 
and which is carried from generation to generation. By this same concept, which seems to be inevitable, and uh, brings us to the simple primary point, namely that the generating principle is everywhere existent, and that creatures participate in it or of it, but are not primarily in control of it at any time, nor is universal generation dependent upon any order of generated things. A nature where it encounters peculiar difficulties in the perpetuation of certain forms or types of life immediately readapts itself and produces other forms which are capable of surviving. Thus we may uh, begin our general consideration by the basic concept that we have an energy, that this energy is essentially a life energy, that this energy is like a stream or a river flowing from a mysterious source and extending itself over the vast area of the world. That this river or stream rises in a fountain, a fountain of life essence, a fountain of what we are now more or less pseudo-scientifically inclined to refer to simply as energy. Energy, however, performs more than one function. And while it is true that in the process of generation more than one function is present, it is also true that the whole process of generation does not exhaust the potential of the area of this energy. Let us then assume again that perhaps we can use a tree to signify the principle involved, referring not necessarily to human beings, but to all processes of nature involving the formation and development and maintenance of structure by cellular chemistry or biochemistry. We then come uh, to the idea that we have a root energy, that this root energy is essentially solar, cosmic, universal, that this root energy functions not only in our way of life, but in every conceivable way of life, where it is necessary for any reason to create structure to create living tissue, to form bodies or vehicles for the manifestation of intelligence or consciousness. Out of this root energy, then, rises the life which maintains the entire tree. This life, perhaps, may be likened in its root to a seed. For we have the concept of a seed energy. We have the concept of energy growing in space. We have also the concept which we can understand because we can observe it, that all of that which comes from energy or which unfolds from the nuclear source of energy all that is to come forth is archetypally contained within the seed itself, so that the oak tree, in all its glory and beauty, is locked within the acorn. And the unfoldment of the energy of the acorn must inevitably produce the oak tree. Thus, in some way, we have an energy that has a destiny, 
that this destiny is inherent in the energy. That this energy is a name which we have bestowed upon one of the great creative processes of existence. We therefore see, as in the case of the tree, that this energy will produce in its own growth a series of supports. It produces the trunk of the tree. It produces the great massive branches with their barks and their heavy fibers. It produces the very subtle buds of the tree. It causes the leaves and the small twigs to come. It finally brings about for this oak tree the recreation of the acorn so that the life of the oak is consummated in the acorn which it produces even as the oak itself grew from a previous acorn. Thus in the process of the development of this energy it is passing through consistent processes from its own natural seed state to the final production of further seed. The Indian, the Hindu, has this story in his wonderful symbolism of the lotus blossom, in which this lotus itself becomes the mystical symbol of the whole process of the perpetuation of life on all levels. Nature in its curious and wondrous economy, working as it does from a comparatively simple archetypal framework, makes use of the same processes in the generation of other things. And we are now coming more and more to realize that consciousness, mind, all of the powers of the human being are in their own way fulfilling the same basic laws that in the universal energy field of space there are the seeds of all things that can ever be manifested from space. Therefore, there is not only the energy seed which leads to fertility, but there is the mind seed which leads to thought or to reason. There is the psychic seed which leads to the perfection of the sensory perceptions and the aesthetic qualities. And religion has always taught that there was a spiritual seed arising in God, substantially and co-identically one with God, by means of which the consciousness of God as a seed is planted in the soul or inner nature of every living creature. Thus the journey from the seed through creation to the production of the new seed is one of the great cyclic principles of existence. Man in his own compound nature therefore carries the power of this seed process. He carries it not only in the terms of the perpetuation of species but in the generation of all of the psychic, mental and emotional powers which he possesses. This concept brings us then straight into the main problem with which we are concerned. The recognition that the primary seed of being, of existence, described by the Oriental as a lotus seed dropped into the fields of chaos, that this seed in its own proper environment or earth which is space itself vitalized by the spiritual equivalent of the processes of cell impregnation 
by what the ancient mystics called the fiat, or the creative word, the power, symbolizing the active agent, that this seed so impregnated unfolds into existence, and that all existence is therefore the unfolding of the seed of being. Now this is a large thought that has a great deal hanging upon it. Therefore, we must try uh, to sense this uh, as completely as possible. In religion and philosophy, we have this type of symbolism, but we have a peculiar phase of it which I think has defeated it in majority of instances. We think of this vast process, uh, process as having occurred at a remote, almost incalculable period apart from us, that in the beginning these things happened, and that in some mysterious way from this beginningness was created the universe. Also from it issued forth the gods as the creators of secondary things. From it came forth all the orders of life. And as a result, the worlds were made beautiful with the flora and fauna that developed upon them. And in the course of creation, according to religion, or in the course of evolution, according to science, uh, this uh, great area of fertility uh, caused to emerge man represent, so to say, the extension of this process of enlivenment uh, from a previous animal origin to the present human state. And beyond this, the possibility, not too well analyzed, that this process might produce in time a still superior type something very difficult to, uh, for us to imagine to be possible, considering the excellence of our present state. <laughs> In fact, if nature doesn't produce something superior rather soon, we're all going to be in trouble. <laughs> but the remoteness of this procedure and the concept that we have that it now represents a rather neat and tidy package that the worlds are all here, that the things we need have all been created, and therefore that all we have to do now is permit these processes to continue as they always have, and we will either survive or else. And if we do not survive, the problem will no longer be of great concern to us. This, I think, is a static and false position. I think what we have failed to recognize is that this tremendous seminal or seed-like basic energy, bursting from the process of its own inception, is in itself in a process of continual growth. This is the point uh, which has generally been ignored. We know that in the great tree, even though it may be a mighty sequoia, the tree must either grow or die. And in the universe, there is nothing finished. Energy must continue its own growth or die. Therefore, the procedures of the moving of a subjective energy principle into objective energy manifestation is continuous and perpetual and will exist until such termination is placed upon it as is inherent in its own archetype. And the nature of this termination we cannot even adequately conceive. We cannot conceive of the death of life. We can conceive of living things passing into the death state of their forms or bodies. 
But we also realize that the very moment a person or being is dying, another is born. And that in the great pageantry of things, organisms may cease. But the power which organizes, creates, or vitalizes organisms is itself, as the Hindus realized, the only immortal. Now let us try to bring this within some kind of a pattern of understanding. Let us imagine now that what we term energy, in its original state, is very much like the energy in the seed of anything, because nature is forever repeating its own processes, and that it is natural and inevitable in the seed to grow. And placed in a proper circumstance or environment, it will germinate and fulfill its reasonable expectancy. Let us then assume that energy in space is a continually unfolding plant-like thing, a living thing, far more than a plant as we know it, because it is a plant fully conscious of its own existence, a plant moving inevitably toward the fulfillment of an expectation which is inherent within itself. Now what is the actual expectation of energy. We have to use symbolic terms. Perhaps expectation is not a formidable word, a word which could be defended in debate. But I think it carries the thing we are trying to put as simply as possible. The expectation of energy is the total expression of itself. The inevitable of energy is that it shall energize everything. That there shall be no air, no spot, no place, anywhere within the natural area of energy, which is not ultimately, completely, and fully energized. What would be the deterrent to this process? And the answer in the old philosophical system, of course, was that energy, so to say, has an adversary. Now, this adversary is not a real being. It is not a thing. This adversary is a space dimension which the old Gnostic said was deprived of energy. Namely, that energy moves in a negative area or a negative field. And that this negative field is the static adversary which energy must overcome. Therefore, energy may be said to be continually bringing forth life. Now, as there is only one principle of life, and only one principle of energy, and only one principle of matter or substance, and this matter or substance itself is a condition of energy, and exists only because the energy agent is already active in it, then we may say that the energy uh, opponent, the adversary of energy, is a different condition of itself, because there is no other condition that can exist. Now, what is the other condition of itself? This other condition of itself is a degree of energization, inadequate for the full expression of energy at any given time. Now, let us see if we can straighten that out uh, and make it as reasonable as possible. Let's therefore go to the problem of a child growing up. Here is an expression of this principle. A child, we assume, receives a body 
This body is alive at birth, but not useful. In fact, it is perhaps the least useful of all forms of living structure, because the child uh, does not develop even the power to preserve itself for a number of years. This body, though composed totally of living energy structures, is incapable in the beginning of manifesting the intellectual power within that body, the emotional power, and at the beginning can manifest very little physical power. This process of maturing a body until it is capable of serving as an instrument for a condition of energy was by the ancients broadened to recognize or represent the entire problem on all levels. Namely, that energy or life itself in the eternal process of its own unfoldment it depends upon something else. It depends very largely for its growth upon a reflex or reactive process of growth in substance. Now, substance is merely a condition of itself, that is, of energy. Energy expanding through substance is continually vitalizing substance. This vitality, in turn, results in the improvement of forms or structures, and this improvement in turn releases more energy. And the process continues on in a double-pronged process of growth. This process ha has as its final end that the form and the energy shall be exactly equal to each other that there shall be no deficiency in form in its ability to manifest energy, and that there shall be no deficiency in energy for anything that form needs or requires. Now, if we can imagine this process occurring in space, we then have a rather interesting concept to begin something with. We have an infinite life moving continuously into this infinite manifestation. We have it flowing in all directions and in all dimensions simultaneously. We find the very processes of this making fertile the sleeping seminal content of matter, that this fertility causes matter to begin the process of fulfilling the laws of energy in matter by producing organisms. The purpose of these organisms is not their own growth. The purpose of all these organisms is that they shall rise to meet the motion of creative energy moving into manifestation. So what we commonly know as evolution is a more or less twofold procedure. It is energy moving over the area set aside for the, its own creative processes and calling forth, as Bermi says, from the abyss, from the depth, from the deep, forms gradually increasing in value, in refinement, by evolutionary process to become instruments or vehicles for the manifestation of energy. Now this growth contains one process that is a little difficult for us to understand, perhaps, namely that the impact of energy upon form is always shattering, because the form is never adequate to the energy at this period in the development of things. Also we have to recognize that this energy moving into manifestations has a manifestation has innumerable conditions within itself. This energy appears to move outward in waves, 
like the tidal motion of oceans, or perhaps more symbolically like the ripples resulting from a stone dropped into a pool. The ancients were aware of the tidal motion of energy, which they called the out-breathing and the in-breathing of God. They recognized, as Plato pointed out, that the continual development of energy was according to certain laws or principles inherent in itself. What we therefore call the differentiation of species, the different levels of structure containing the various degrees of manifested consciousness which we see about us represent the levels of the various modes of energy in the process of its own manifestation. Therefore, we have to assume that forms generated in various ways become instruments of a level or of a kind, and that wherever this level is reached, energy moving into manifestation produces level consciousness, level attainment, level growth, level specialization. As a result of this, in turn, we have an infinite diversity of the manifestations of a single energy. This comes, then, to perhaps one of the neatest problems that we have today and one I think interests all of us profoundly, and that is the problem of heredity. Now, we have already attempted in the scientific world to understand the laws governing heredity. And we have created a situation which, scientifically speaking, is philosophically unsound. We have created a situation in which the unfoldment of life is placed in the fragile keeping of a dubious ancestry or a series of so-called accidental processes for which life has no adequate solution. This situation is not essentially true. It cannot be. It cannot be that in a universe governed by absolute law, a creature uh, can, as a result of heredity, be born into a hopeless situation, mentally, emotionally, or physically. Nor is it possible for us any longer to assume that the child is the extension of the psychic energy of the parent by way of generation. Therefore, we cannot assume that the parent gives birth to the child. We cannot assume that the child is in each instance merely the extension of its ancestry. If we assume this, we assume a situation that is utterly contrary to the available facts that we can discover in nature. It is true that we are at a loss and that we are further complicated by certain appear, apparent facts which we have hastily accepted. Psychologically, we have accepted the importance of the transmission of characteristics. We find that a child born of a family with a certain type of attitude seems to be born with that attitude, or perhaps with a great repugnance to that attitude, but at least heavily conditioned by it. The fight as to whether the child's temperament has been modified before birth or subsequent to birth as a result of conditioning goes on. Most uh, geneticists deny the concept that the parental nature can be directly inherited. But at the same time, 
they also assume that the new person, the child, is the direct product of its ancestry, that its entire nature originates in the ancestral pattern, and that consciousness arises as the result of an abstract psychological chemistry taking place in the area of inherited or hereditary characteristics, qualities, and substances. Now this actually creates the ultimate state that the child coming into conscious existence is merely a consciousness derived from hereditary contribution that regardless of how we look at it, this remains true. Let's take an extremely materialistic position. Let's assume, for instance, that we do not believe that there is any psychic heredity, that we do not believe, as the ancients did, that the child could be prenatally influenced by the emotions or thoughts of parents. And let us assume that the only part of this child's organism that is transmitted is the physical body. If, however, you take the, the scientific position that consciousness is a byproduct of the physical body itself, then the total being is the product of heredity. There is no way of escaping the implication. And the, in, the total being is therefore the helpless production of something that has preceded it. The helpless progeny of parents who perhaps would give anything if the child was not like themselves. <laughs> and are much disappointed when they see their own characteristics emerging. Why do these characteristics emerge? Let us then ask another question. If heredity is merely a principle involving the descent of fertility, then we have to recognize a very intricate philosophical principle. We know today something that we didn't know a hundred years ago. The effect of the psychic integration upon bodily structure and function. We know today that our attitudes and our psychological integration, or lack of it, can affect the procreative power. So now the next generation is a byproduct not only of our chemistry but of our notions. And we may therefore not be too surprised if it gives us a little worry. If the new generation is a little bit on the delinquent side, we now have the full explanation. It is a projection of our own delinquency. Now this in itself seems to be poetic justice, but it is wonderfully interesting and intriguing and just, perhaps, that the parent should have the burden of a child whose temperament is similar to its own. But in all this situation, are we not a little hard on the child? Here we limit or condemn a creature to a situation uh, which is only present because of the parental factor. And we also condemn this child with whatever imbalances and imperfections it inevitably has, to become in turn the rejoicing parent of future generations, so that this procedure will go on to eternity ad nauseum. <laughs> we have here a breaking down and a defeating of the entire process of life. What we are therefore seeking is an explanation which will justify the known 
observed circumstances and at the same time give the universe something more of integrity than the present explanation is able to confer. It is inconceivable to us that the universe could depend upon the frailty of man's increasingly neurotic temperament for the fulfillment of its vast and inconceivable purposes. There was a time perhaps when man felt that this was possible, that after all he was the noblest work of God. But today the thoughtful person hardly dares to say this and at the same time uh, believe deity to be a being of integrity or value. Now let us see what would happen if we took the attitude that instead of the parent being the origin of the child, that the parent is merely a bead upon its long thread which passes through many beads and that the life principle of generation has an existence of itself that it moves through the long deep channels of created things but is never identical with them never bound to them are never dependent upon them except in certain details. That the life that passes from one generation to another is not and cannot be, we will say, contaminated in itself by the instruments through which it passes. That this life is apart from and superior to the attitudes or conditions of any living thing. That the organism, be it human or animal, carries within itself continuously and inevitably this power uh, to extend life into futurity but that this power to extend life is a part of the psychic nature which cannot be contaminated by the attitudes or conditions of the person through whom it passes. That this life passing through every form in nature survives all forms, cannot be trapped or captured in any of them ultimately produces all conditions, but is itself unconditioned and capable of an infinite extension beyond any condition through which it passes at any time. This makes the perpetuation of the power to create form something entirely separate from the essential structure of human psychology. That this form is perpetuated as a result of the presence of an energy, a spark, a life principle, superior to and separate from any psychological, emotional, mental, or physical circumstance. Therefore, we can say now, this, assuming it to be true, still leaves us with a dilemma. If this is true, how are we going to explain that individuals may be able to destroy or elements of sickness or circumstance may destroy the power of propagation? that therefore it is not inevitable that any being propagate. Nor is it inevitable that life itself will break through obstacles set up to propagation and force it 
where either it is not reasonable or not desired? The answer is very simple in one point, namely that the process of reproduction depends always upon the available catalysts or polarities existing within the body or nature which is going to or should propagate. However, the failure to propagate has no effect upon the energy of propagation any more than the fact that a wind blows a twig from a tree kills the tree. Any branch which is cut off from the tree withers and dies, but the tree does not die. Any form of life which is cut off from its energy supply will not perpetuate its kind, because it will not produce the necessary physical chemistries and physiological processes by means of which life can be reproduced. But this does not affect the continuity of that life itself. That life may or may not be in any way touched by this frustration of one twig or leaf upon the great tree of generation. It also naturally follows that in a particular instance a structure for the perpetuation of life must derive its physical materials from the available biological supply and that therefore uh, the impregnation of the human cell and its development is associated with, as Paracelsus points out, the chemical and alchemical elements available in the organisms involved. There is therefore no reason to assume that heredity means any more than what it does mean, namely the natural deriving of material from the only reasonable available source. That these materials may form a structure resembling in many respects the parental structure is because the materials are so derived that in the process of generation not only is the one cellular structure involved but this cellular structure mirrors the available energies, the available principles, the available substances derived from the entire structure of the parental chemistry. Thus the newborn person may inherit certain tendencies of a bodily nature, may inherit biochemical disturbances which are likely to produce temperamental peculiarities. And as these disturbances were inherited with the substances from which the bodies were built, they may in turn react upon temperament, causing a parallel of certain dispositional traits. But these parallels are not always uniform or equal. And in all these different processes of generation, we must be prepared for exceptions, for these exceptions are continually occurring. The next point, then, is to bear in mind the simple purpose of nature. Nature producing human beings produces them as the result of energy having set up within the unfolding structure of humanity its natural processes, and these processes are followed through what we call generation. But the energy moving through these processes moves through all of them and is like one tremendous stream breaking up and descending through the branches of families, of races, of sub-races, of types, and of subtypes. 
And this streaming life that is continually flowing into manifestation is evolving in its own way. And evolution is a twofold process of which the first process is the ideation or emanation over a vast area of a principle of energy. This principle having locked within itself the archetypal fulfillment of its own nature, in this case the fulfillment of its own purpose. Now, what is the conceivable purpose of this energy? Apparently, the purpose is this, that under the term energy, we are conceiving of something for which we can have little accurate understanding. We think of energy primarily as force. We think of energy as an energizing agent. But philosophy thinks of it in a much larger way. Philosophy thinks of it in the term of a synonym for pure life, and that life contains within it all that is living. Therefore, this energy is not merely a Freudian generating energy. This energy has generation as one of its powers. Plato and Pythagoras assumed that this energy had eight powers. Actually, in all probability, this would only be a classification of the most obvious factors recognizable by man, because the powers of energy are probably limitless, beyond calculation. But this energy contains locked within itself also the seeds of life as conscious experience. It contains within itself consciousness, intelligence, and force. It carries within itself every faculty, power, and dimension of our comprehension, and also innumerable extra faculties beyond anything that we know at the moment. And we only can assume that energy carries within it total consciousness. That this total consciousness is an infinite capacity to become more conscious. That this infinite capacity to become more conscious must theoretically end in something. I think Buddha was working upon this same concept when he intimated that the ultimate of consciousness, so to say, is a nirvanic totality, a suspension of all imperfection, an outgrowing of all limitation, and that the end is therefore free consciousness in space. To achieve this end, then, we must assume that consciousness from a seed is growing until it completes itself by becoming all conscious in all condition, place, space, and dimension. To achieve this inconceivable purpose, therefore, uh, consciousness locked in energy is continuously manifesting. Energy creates through generational processes forms. These forms, according to their orders, their degrees of development, and the central nervous system which develops in them, become instruments for the manifestations of fragmentary parts of consciousness. Therefore, we may also point out that all activity in itself bears witness to some degree of consciousness. When, for example, the little rabbit is a baby and does not know what to do, it follows its mother's tail. 
which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. When the tail comes up, the rabbit sits up. When the tail goes down, the rabbit hides and huddles to the earth, because these are what it has learned to be the way of salvation. This is an expression of consciousness. Years ago, a hunter pointed out something that was very interesting, that a wild deer in its native state, if attacked by an animal, will run to a man, even though the man has a gun. Why? Because the animal instinctively recognizes that man has superior intelligence. This is a form of consciousness, intuitive. Everywhere in nature, consciousness exists. It takes a certain degree of consciousness for things merely to continue of themselves. It takes consciousness to allow a monocellular organism to merely exist. It takes more consciousness where motion comes in. It takes more consciousness where self-survival moves in. But everywhere there is consciousness. And this consciousness is everywhere being released through the degrees of organisms perpetuated by the generational process. Thus the human being, by generation, produces a type of organism in which a consciousness, which we call human consciousness, can exist, can function. Now, with the number of human beings that exist, with their different degrees of development, differing degrees lying backward through the descent of what is called bloodline, which is nothing but tube for energy, we have an infinite diversity of specializations of human consciousness among human beings. We have lower forms of life in which some degrees of consciousness are more specialized than in us. We have many variations upon the theme of consciousness, but we may say that consciousness is a kind of awakening by means of which a kind of awareness increases in life attaining finally to the hypothetical condition of self-awareness, which we call man. Thus we have, in this descending energy, we have the rudiment, we have the substance or the essence of all that energy implies. Namely, that energy implies not only growth, and motion, and survival, perpetuation, but it also implies mentation, the enrichment of emotional content, the love of beauty, art, music, the power of philosophy and reason, the highest sciences and most exact phases which we now associate with mind. For mind is only a name that we give to a subtle organism for the distribution of a certain phase of universal energy. And this universal energy, differentiated upon a prism of mental process, becomes what we call mental energy. All of this is leading us gradually to the point where we have to recognize that there is moving through us all the time a kind of life that has as its ultimate goal the complete revelation of itself. Now, in every human being and in every form known to man, this revelation is incomplete. In all nature studied together, we become aware of an infinitely larger variation of revelation. We see revelation as small flowers growing out of the earth. We see revelation 
in the industry of the ant and the bee. We see revelation in the fruitfulness of living things and in the magnificent productions of human ingenuity. These things, however, in no way exhaust revelation. We see revelation as religious experience, producing all the religions that we know, but still locked within it are all the religions that have not yet come. But these new things, because the motion of energy is orderly, each one of these new organisms arises from pre previous organisms. And even in the most abstract of theological institutions, religion is perpetuated by generation, by the mingling and mixing of previous concepts and the revelation of a new degree of religious energy. So our central fountain of energy is all things unto all things. And in the processes of its own motion or development, it is constantly flowing into the structures and forms which it generates. Now in nature there doesn't seem to be anything that very seriously gets in the way of process. But with man there is a certain difference in this. And we behold or observe that it is possible for this energy process to come into conflict with the organisms which it creates. If these organisms fail to fulfill their appointed tasks, then they inhibit or limit or restrict the motion of energy. And we know, as Paracelsus has pointed out, that nearly everything that can be wrong with a human being is the result of energy blockage of some kind. If physical energy is not able uh, to achieve its proper circulation in the body, the individual is physically sick. If there is anything to interfere with the proper circulation of psychical energy, the individual is psychically sick. If anything interferes with or impairs the circulation of mental energy, the individual is mentally sick. And wherever these processes are impaired, a series of dramatic situations result. You realize that nature, in building up sequentially and in perfect pattern, this pyramid of unfolding energy factors, has achieved and must maintain a certain kind of momentum. That this process of building always brings life to a new level of insecurity. Uh, there can be no security until ultimate security is attained. And wherever energy in its manifestation is unable to advance its own specializations, there comes a very serious crisis in the development and unfoldment of living things. So we now have to proceed for a moment from the opposite pole of this. Energy building upward is creating in space by means of the seminal energies of space a series of forms. The Gnostics were well aware of this concept of, ev of emanational reflex. Forms rising out of matter to become the instruments of energy. As energy unfolds, forms must unfold to receive this energy. And the balance of the universe is maintained by a series of positive and negative reactions that for every energy there must be a receptacle. 
that for every energy that is specialized or released there must be an instrument of manifestation. That the instruments or the bodily factors or the structural factors must unfold with the unfolding of the causal energy itself. In man, the bodily unfoldment implies now not only physical establishment by generation, vital maintenance, emotional equilibrium, and mental advancement. All of these must work together so that the total pattern of man is available for the manifestation of a certain condition of energy. If any of this complex machinery goes out of order, then energy moving into manifestation moves in without the full cooperation of the instrument in which it is manifesting. This lack of cooperation is known as conflict. And wherever this conflict exists, energy moves against energy rather than with it, because it is the inevitable of energy that it shall overcome and overthrow all barriers to the progress of itself. If a dam, therefore, is put across the natural growth of the individual at any point, energy will ultimately destroy that dam. And if the individual has foolishly built his house at the foot of the dam, assuming that this dam will hold, he will be swept away by the natural energy of life itself. Thus, the growth of the human personality through infancy, childhood, adolescence, and maturity represents a recapitulation in structural development of the principal steps by means of which energy has achieved the integration of the human personality. An energy moving in upon this, if it is frustrated, if it is blocked, is unable to achieve its natural and inevitable purposes through that organism. Now, one of the things that is always the enemy of energy in all structures is crystallization. Crystallization in the body blocks certain types of energy. Crystallization in the emotions will block another type. Crystallization in the mind will block still another type. So the crystallizations of various kinds, among which we may mentally note such things as opinions and fixations. These will block the natural flow of energy or prevent this energy from achieving its own purpose, namely its own freedom through the personality. The energy that is in the individual has no particular intention of staying there. It doesn't necessarily stay there even for a moment. A study of the magnetic field of the human body shows that energy is pouring from it continuously. And this energy can all move out in many ways. It can move out physically. For each human body or any other form that it creates is a microcosm of itself. And man, as an energy field, is continually contributing to the energy of lesser things. Energy is moving out of him and through him. Just as his physical energy, therefore, becomes part of the physical availability of energy, so his emotional energy is part of the available store of beauty, of love, of nobility, of fineness, which is developing in the world. His mental energy flows out as the wisdom of life contributing to the improvement of, of all human beings of this generation and all generations past and to come. Thus energy 
through the personality of man is being continually transformed into utilities. Certain phases of it. But the mainstream, of course, continues to protect itself insofar as it can by ensuring that there will be new channels for this energy. And that this energy will therefore continue to radiate from a center which is everywhere to a circumference that is nowhere. Infinite manifestation. Wherever the individual comes into conflict with the natural motion of energy, he is delaying the second prong of the process of evolution. For evolution is not merely life ideating. Evolution is form ascending to meet life, represented in Eastern philosophy by the spiral in the conch shell. And of the very beautiful poem, Build More Noble Mansions, O My Soul. The noble mansions, the better houses, are being built from one level of energy, carrying the individual upward to a certain point, where these are ensouled by another kind of energy. What appears to be uh, definite, is that this energy, this energy itself, being, as we said, a series of ripples, that this energy is moving for its fulfillment upon several levels even as man is. Now man's physical energy is of great value to him in many things. He does not have to be a mental giant in order to use it. In fact, he hasn't to have to have an idea of any kind. He can work for somebody else who has one. He can simply chop wood. He can plow the ground. He can perform labor by energy alone. And today we even regard energy of that kind as worth about four to six dollars an hour. It's gotten to be more valuable than it used to be. Therefore, physical energy is necessary for the maintenance and maintenance of an organization by which we are in this world at this time. And being in this world at this time is essentially and evidently part of the archetypal purpose of energy. Some energy goes into clear space, into orders of life we know nothing about. But some energy follows along what we term biological lines and produces creatures such as we know and see. But whether this energy is perfecting the magnetic field of a planet or animating creatures, it is fulfilling one of its innumerable purposes. And one of these innumerable purposes, as far as we are able to observe, is the maintenance of a physical structure by means of which man can release by internal chemistry a series of superphysical attributes. Thus man builds a complicated nervous system. He develops organs and structures. He develops a brain. He develops a central and a sympathetic or autonomic nervous reflex system. These things are not necessary, essentially, to his survival. But they are necessary to his function, to his existence as a dynamic living thing. And at the stage of, na of the unfoldment of energy which man has achieved, energy requires this complicated structure which we know as essential and proper to its purpose. Why it does so, we can only say, rests in the will of the energy itself. But we are assumed, assuming again that the ultimate purpose of all energy is freedom, and freedom is the complete expression of itself. Now man having achieved, therefore, the structural development by means of a certain kind of energy 
at various periods creates centers within himself by means of which further energies may be liberated in him or through him. This is very much like the process of tuning in a series of stations on a radio or a television. Depending upon the quality of the instrument and upon the adequacy of the aerial, various stations can be tuned in, whereas a neighbor with a poorer instrument may not be so fortunate. But whenever we tune in to a level of energy, we get a program. And that is one of our troubles, troubles in most instances. But what might we say would be the first and most important tuning in of energy? Apparently, the great principle of energy as itself moves and makes one essential polarization in the life of developing man. And that is that the energy as form builder, energy as the animator of form, is able to move in when the prenatal structure of the body reaches the degree of growth in which it is able to tune in the energy stream. Prior to that time, the energy has been provided by the parental energy fields. But at what time what that we call the quickening, the individual becomes a direct avenue for the release of energy, physical energy. From that time on, energy begins the process of enlivening the form. The energy was there all the time, but part of the process of generation is to build in a degree of organization by which the positive pole of energy can move in. Up to that time, the structure is sustained only by the negative pole of energy, which is the negative field supplied by the evolving uh, substances of life which we call matter which have their own energies, but which energies are not capable of carrying a life beyond a certain point, but they are capable of creating a certain level of organization which then can be vitalized or taken over. And all the processes that we know in growth consist of levels of energy taking over through structures capable of sustaining them. And the structure as it develops passes through a series of distinct phases or conditions. At a certain time, the principle of growth takes over. This is due to the exhaustion of certain endocrine secretion in the infant. Later, the process of emotional intensification takes over from the energy field. Later, the mental process takes over, producing the major divisions of childhood, adolescence, and maturity. Each case, however, the energy does not drive the bargain. The energy, being everywhere always, is simply tuned in by the evolving organism. As the structure advances, the organism is able to accept what the Greeks would term an ensoulment by energy. Now remember, this isn't blind energy we're talking about. This is energy which is capable of releasing any degree of consciousness that the organism is capable of sustaining. So when the individual reaches maturity, he achieves this end as a human being by being capable of receiving into himself and transforming and ultimately transmitting that degree of conscious energy which we call selfhood or egoism or the I amness 
in man. As Buddha pointed out, this is by no means the end. But it is as far as man can normally accomplish. The body which has been built therefore becomes the instrument of this conscious energy principle. Now the energy descending through infinite specialization has produced orders of life between itself and man which are not visible to man. Energy coming in as consciousness is not merely a mass, a substance. Energy coming in as consciousness is already a highly conditioned existence. And we have every reason to suspect, therefore, the essential validity of the Vedantic and yogic positions on this. Namely, that consciousness, the atmic nature of life, the true Atman, is identical with all others. That p pure spirit, pure consciousness, on the human level, is identical and one with all other human consciousness on the same level. Therefore, that the I consciousness in each individual is shared by all, and that the appearance of individuality is due to the organism and not to the division in the principle itself. Therefore, one self manifesting through an infinite number of bodies becomes apparently an infinite number of selves. But this self principle like all of the other causal agencies, is actually one substance. We therefore come to the, the, the very simple process that behind humanity as a level of consciousness, there is the human state of energy, which was the Anthropos, or the Adam Kodman of the Kabbalah the one man who became all men, the Manu of the ancient Indians. That within this one man, therefore, again, there is a series of differentiations. This one being differentiating into evolving individualities produces the so-called conscious beings that are embodied in form. But all of these conscious beings are themselves varying degrees of growing seed within the energy field. Thus evolution is infinite life coming into infinite manifestation through forms passing through infinite modifications. And in this, then, we are not in conflict with the basic principle of heredity. We recognize that bodies belonging to a common reservoir of body have their own laws in the same way that mind belonging to a common reservoir of mind has its unique and peculiar laws. But we do know that the fulfillment of the plan for things must be that forms are forever meeting energies, growing to and to be ensouled by them, and that the continuous growth of life in its total spiritual, moral, intellectual, and physical status consists of this increasingly understanding partnership between form and energy. <coughs> Without this partnership, life as we know it cannot develop. The cell is the instrument, therefore, by means of which the partnership between body and the degree of consciousness which body is able to manifest, that this partnership is made possible. And the infinite procedure by which this is achieved seems infinitely complicated to the scientific mind. 
but in nature itself it is merely one of innumerable expressions of the same process, everywhere repeating itself, on all levels according to their need and their kind, and varying in no essential principle. This is why the old way of thinking is so vital, is that it has no exceptions, that it does not have to create a new solution for every problem. It recognizes only one essential problem in relation to man, and that is the possibility that man will not keep faith with the motion of energy through him that man will not continue in the essential purposes for which he was intended. Now here is where our moral question and our ethical question comes in. The human mind, being capable of a degree of what Aquinas calls self-determinism, therefore has a right in a sense to choose its purposes or choose its projects. The only way in which it can know with certainty whether it is right or wrong in its selection is the consequence. All amount of abstract contemplation in this is to a measure futile. The only way in which the individual can know whether a certain procedure is next for him is determined by what it does to him. It might be perfectly properly next for someone else, but not, might not be next for him. If what he is doing is next for him, the chemical compound of consequence will enlarge his participation in consciousness. More consciousness will move into him. More consciousness will find polar possibility in the structure which he has set up. If the individual, for example, centers his entire life upon the development of body, he by this determinism of his own may neglect those processes by means of which the consciousness quotient can be increased. Now, this consciousness quotient is important. Now, let us take, for example, an individual who has decided that he is going to be a great athlete. He is going to limit his development and his consciousness largely to the improvement of his body. He is going to be primarily a physical person. By this concentration of energy, he changes the total compound of his nature. Actually, he has caused something to grow. Some part of himself is a little more or a little better than it was. He has devoted his time and his thought to learning all that he could about physical culture. Therefore, he has become able to do certain things and to achieve certain ends not previously attainable. But here is his difficulty. He has enriched the compound a little, but he has not enriched the instrument to control it. Therefore, he is in a problem. He has added something to the total nature of himself without adding the control factors. The control factors in all case be, cases being the power to enlarge consciousness to meet the demand of function. A new function demands new governorship, a new degree of unfoldment. Maybe very slight, but it still is never sufficient. So the individual, in all of his specialized activities, outgrows his total insight and then falls into emergency. The only answer to this is that there must be more release of energy as consciousness, or energy as thought, or energy as feeling, to control the ramifications 
of the applications of energy to the physical or environmental structure of the individual. Because after all, energy is working for release and knows the way it wants to go. And that which delays or inhibits the total release becomes an obstacle to the energy. Obviously, if the obstacle becomes too great, the energy is unable to function or breaks through, damages structure, and may ultimately result in the sterilization of that organism, which no longer continues. But this has nothing to do with the life. The life goes on. Because life, consciousness, intelligence belong to one level, and energy in physical structure belongs to another. And our student of the cellular processes is dealing totally with that form of energy which is used in form building. We are thinking in philosophy more of that form of energy which is used in character building. But the same processes go on. Thoughts are generated like bodies. That is why the brain is so constituted that it is a generating structure. Thus, in all of these fields of activity, what we might term progress, essential progress, true progress, is this continual adjustment between the radiant of energy emerging from its own source and the construction of the instruments for the expression of that energy in space. And where there is any interference with this process, we have danger that energy will be defeated in an instrument, or in a vehicle, or in a time, or in a place, or in a nation, or in a race. And that which is, which is defeated, where energy is defeated, it simply deserts the organism. And this is true of all forms of progress. Buddhism recognizes this, recognizes the chemical constitution of the consciousness unit, and that this consciousness unit in man is, as far as man himself is concerned, the knower. And the end and purpose of the knower is that the knower shall know truth. And the, and the reason that it must know truth is because it is only when it knows that it can cooperate completely. And it is only when it possesses this inward understanding that it can become the clear channel for the release of purpose itself, which is resident in energy as absolute consciousness. Consequently, the highest wisdom among all great philosophical systems has been the wisdom that causes man to understand the divine nature and obey it. And whether we say divine nature or we say energy, we must still keep its laws. And the problem of modern man is this problem of being sidetracked, so that instead of man unfolding, he simply goes on a level. He simply continues but does not grow. And when anything continues without growing, it must die. Because continuance in nature is only maintained by the continual unfoldment of instruments, so that the end achieved may always be worthy of the great means which were used to achieve it. Consequently, we say this, and I think it will ultimately be scientifically demonstrated, that heredity is not the answer uh, to the consciousness allotment of any individual, that such an explanation is unnecessary and contrary to the evidence of life around us, that what we call heredity is simply the individual's uses of available materials. And that as this body develops, when it actually reaches its majority, it overwhelms its heredity and takes control of the situation itself. The only reason why this is not true, 
or need, need not be true in every instance, is because in spite of the passing of years, a large part of mankind never reaches maturity. Maturity is therefore not to be measured by years, but maturity is the attainment of a degree of consciousness release which is superior to that release bestowed by heredity. When the individual is able to excel that which has gone before, he is free from it and possesses the power of his own individual integration. In this way, I think we can get a broader picture, a larger concept of what constitutes the coming into life of the human being. That the machinery of generation is a wonderful and extraordinary thing but that the purpose of this machinery is not the perpetuation of species, primarily. The purpose of it is the continual unfolding of forms to become instruments for the release of life. And it is this one life itself that, uns that ensouls forms. And this life is conscious. And in universal things, it is universally conscious. In individual things, it is individually conscious. In collective things, it is collectively conscious. And in total case of isolation, it has the peculiar consciousness of aloneness. But these are aspects provided by the instrument into which it enters. And the purpose of the entire project is that these instruments shall forever improve or be better to the ultimate condition in which forms as forms, by constant improvement, become less formal and more like energy, until in the end they are energy. And this ultimate identity of energy, energy growing up, and energy descending, the ultimate identity of these two is absolute consciousness in all things everywhere. Beyond this point, we cannot conceive. But it is obvious that the end which nature is striving to achieve is that man shall continually outgrow himself. For by outgrowing what he was, he outgrows the energy part or the energy allotment which was his, and by this circumstance attunes in to a greater energy allotment. This is the search for security, the search for peace, the search for life. And the individual who directs his attention to the unfoldment of those powers by which his superior energies are channeled, becomes more suitable, more useful, more happy than the person who, turning his attention from these essentials, mistaking the purposes of the body for those of universal energy. This person fails, has already produced adequate animal forms to achieve the purpose. And when man, ceasing to be himself, retires to an animal state, he is not even an animal, because too many of his energy elements have already exceeded this state. Therefore, he is a kind of hybrid. He is a creature in which no value is clearly indicated. And unless nature is able to correct this condition, this type of thing becomes sterile it is no longer suitable for the purposes for which it was intended. If we think in this larger way, I believe, the processes of generation will become increasingly clear. And we shall realize, as Lao Tse gives us in the doctrine of Tao, the nature of this one power by which all things are sustained, which takes all shapes in all forms, yet is in itself shapeless. 
that it becomes all things to all beings, but remains forever itself. And that man, through the processes of growth, finally becomes aware of the sovereignty of this fact and moves from a creature sustained to a creature sustaining, or by voluntary uh, effort accomplishes the alchemical mystery of perfecting nature through art and by the consecration or dedication of his own consciousness fulfills what the mystics of all time have taught and hoped for. This in its turn is a new birth upon a new level and the processes of generation still continue. But they continue in their primary purpose which is that the infinite itself shall become completely manifested through all parts of its own nature, releasing its power to every creature, just as human consciousness through the nervous system is distributed throughout the body of man. Through these studies, I believe we can get a better orientation on what might be termed the processes of human generation. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up.